All right. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I think uh, there's still some spaces left to sit. Um, so what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to have uh, a look at a couple of libraries which you can use for doing a bit more functional, stylish programming in Java. I mean, we don't have a functional programming language in Java, so there's other languages on the JVM which actually are purely functional. But uh, there's uh, still some things uh, which we can do. So uh, this is the list of libraries we're going to have a look at, and um, you're going to see how they can help you. So uh, my name is Rabea. I'm uh, from the city of uh, Bremen in Germany, which is probably more known for its beer and its uh, story of the Bremen town musicians. And um, yeah, I'm working at a smaller company called uh, Mikos in Bremen. We are mainly doing uh, other IT stuff, but have a small software development team. And I was also being named Java champion by the end of last year. And this is how I actually started public speaking. This was uh, five years ago uh, here at Divox UK. And I will actually try to look at you more than I did in that talk. You've probably seen me only from the side in that talk. I was uh, Yesterday, when I was uh, looking for a picture, I couldn't find a picture. So I was uh, scrolling through the video, and I was really frantically trying not to look at the audience. So I was either looking like that or looking at my screen at my laptop, but not looking at the audience. So I hope I improve that. Let's see how it goes. Um, so functional programming in Java. Uh, some, some people see it as a kind of evolutionary step, right? So we did uh, go from a machine to assembly to procedural and to object-oriented, and now we go to functional programming. But, you know, might not really be an evolution step. Um, it's just a different style of programming, really. So it's, uh, if you don't want to do functional, if you don't feel well with it, you just uh, keep the stuff you have in Java, right? So um, this is also fine. It's not really an evolution step that you have to take. So a bit of a recap. I think uh, at least the people that studied might have had some functional programming uh, theory in the university. There's actually coming some more theory, if you're interested in that, in a talk uh, which is uh, coming tomorrow by uh, Uberto, who's giving a talk on functional programming as well. But I'm going to show you the li libraries first, and if you want to understand more about the theory or uh, how it works in uh, Kotlin, I think he's showing a lot of Kotlin tomorrow. You can go there. So, uh, the most important thing I think about functional programming is that uh, functions and values are treated the same, so you can pass them around. You can't only pass parameters around and values around, you can also pass uh, functions around, have them as return values. And, um, oh, the clicker doesn't work anymore. All right. Or my computer did freeze. Oh, yes, it did freeze. Great. So, uh, higher order functions. Um, higher order functions can take a parameter uh, as a function or return a function. So, you have a function and you can pass in another function as a parameter, or you have a function which creates a function and returns it back to you. So, uh, this is uh, a characteristic of higher order functions. Then, in functional programming language, you have referential transparency. This uh, sounds very difficult, but it basically means that you can replace all function calls with its value. And the correct, uh, characteristic says um, that the same input should lead to the same output. So, a randomized method, for example, would probably not really help you very much in that case, because uh, you don't have an input and you always have a different output. And uh, it shouldn't have any side effects as well. So if you're um, throwing an ex exception, that's a side effect and it doesn't uh, work for referential transparency. So if you're standing in the back there, there's uh, still some seats over here, if you want to come here. That's fine for me. <laughs> uh, pure functions. Um, pure functions are all functions which are only calling other functions which are referential transparent. So you have a full referential transparency over there, so you still have, uh, for the same input, you get the same output because you're only functions which are pure, which mostly, mostly only works with uh, immutable data structures. So if you have uh, data structures which you can actually mu mute. So we're gonna, gonna see some examples for those uh, in a minute. Um, yeah, closures or lambdas uh, is also a feature. We all know how nowadays how lambdas work. 
Uh, composition lift anchoring, we're going to have an example in a minute, otherwise it's kind of hard to explain. And uh, filter map reduce is also seen as an important feature which usually functional programming languages do have. We all know that we have those on streams now, I hope you're aware of the, all the features on the streams, so that should be easy to understand. So, pure functions, uh, a function which doesn't have any side effects, so for the same input you should have the same output. What you should also not do, is so uh, what we actually do expect from this, um, from this method, it may return some results, right? Calculate results may return some results. Uh, what we don't expect, um, so the, the values um, collection should still stay the same, right? So we can have a result back, but the values collection which we are passing in as a parameter should be the same because it shouldn't have any side effects and modify any parameters which we are passing in. And, uh, but if we have a method like that, which says, okay, values remove if the length is smaller than two, then we will get back an empty list. So this is a side effect, it's not a pure function. So we, um, so you can be very sure that you don't have uh, any side effects if you just favor immutable data structures, which you should um, already do. So uh, return immutable collections and so on. It's much easier to reason about a program. And uh, this is the no another example. This is also not a pure function because uh, it will throw an illegal state exception when you pass in uh, the value A. So other functional stylish additions, uh, we now have this uh, single abstract method type. So for every uh, interface or uh, class which only has a single abstract method, we can uh, use lambdas instead. So these are kind of functional stylish additions. It's still not really functional because they still compile, uh, compile back to types uh, to make them backwards compatible, but it still feels like if we have proper lambdas in there. Um, for that, we have a new functional interfaces. So the functional interfaces that's in your annotation we, we have, uh, we can annotate it so that the compiler makes sure that we only have a single abstract method in there. We still can put a lot of default methods in there to actually help us with achieving that. And uh, we have a function uh, predicate supply and consumer and some more about that, like a B function and so on, um, to have some basic building blocks for actually building some more so sophisticated stuff. Default methods now uh, allow actually to uh, put a new methods into interfaces, which uh, we previously couldn't do. And this is how higher order functions work. So suppose we have an uh, add method down here, and uh, the add method just uh, adds up two values, right? So we are um, returning uh, a function here. So this is already a higher order function. And uh, from the input parameters A and B, we are just uh, adding those up. And we can uh, use this higher order function and passing in the parameters later by uh, calling apply as int uh, 5,6 and then it will calculate re the result which is 11 in that case. Composition, meaning that we can use uh, different different functions and actually composing new functions out of them. So if we are doing uh, the add method again, which we previously had, and we also want to multiply by five in that case, then we can uh, just uh, compose a new function out of them uh, by saying and then and passing in a lambda which says take the previous re result, uh, which was 11 in that case, and multiply by five. And uh, in that case, I use different values, 2 and 7, so t 2 plus 7 is uh, 9 multiplied by 5 is 45 in that case. And uh, currying uh, says we want to fix one of the values. So um, we have the multi multiply operation here, and we're getting back a binary operator. So the binary operator will take two input parameters, A and B in that case, and we're saying uh, A times B. And, but we want to fix one of the values, uh, like we did previously, we only always want to multiply by 5. What we can do with uh, Java is um, make a new method, which is called uh, currying, and then just um, pass in the fixed value over here, which is now the parameter A, so the first parameter, and we just uh, uh, return back a new function, which is not a B function anymore, so it's uh, just a single parameter function, which only takes one of the values, and uh, we fix the value over here by just uh, supplying an A as a fixed uh, value, um, 
over there we have a 5, so this is a 5 as a fixed value, and we still take b as an input value over here, and if we then um, apply the value 6 over here, it's uh, 5 times 6, but 5 is always fixed, so I can only change this one over here. So this is um, how you can use uh, composition and then currying to actually fix one of the parameters. Then uh, with uh, the streams, we have a filter map and reduce. So I'm just only showing our filter and kind of reduce here, um, which is the for each in that case. And uh, there are different operations on the stream. Uh, some are the intermediate operations. So the imp intermediate operations don't give me a final result. It's uh, just a pipeline you are building up with the intermediate operations. Uh, Maurice sitting here in front has a very good talk on that, if you're interested in that. Um, you can I think you're not giving it at the conference, right? But you, you can find it online. So it's a very interesting talk, actually, how to, how to handle streams and uh, the different operations on that one. And um, then we have the terminal operations. And with the terminal operations, you get back a final result. But then you're done with the stream, right? So the stream ends at that point. Everything is uh, going through the pipeline and pulled down the pipeline. And then you have a final result. And you can't use the stream anymore. So this is uh, one of the characteristics of Java 8 streams. So to recap, um, function programming in Java. So functions and values are treated the same. You can pass functions around. Yes, kind of. It's uh, not, not real functions we are passing around, it's still types, but it uh, looks like we're doing it right. Uh, yes, you can uh, build up uh, higher order functions by returning a function from a method or uh, even composing them. Referential transparency is not guaranteed. You can program like if you want to do it. Uh, we see a library later which uh, makes it easier for you. Uh, pure functions, same. We don't have referential transparency, so we can't have pure functions. Uh, closures and lambdas kind of work. Composition, lifting, currying, or works. And filter map reduce, we have those features on the stream. So um, before we start, um, like I said before, like other JVM languages are more functional, so you can have real functional programming if you choose another language. Uh, Java is very conservative in adding new methods to the streams API, but we have already uh, seen some methods which have been added in uh, Java 9, which is uh, drop while and take while. So if people feel that there is a need for them, then uh, they're going to be added, but you're not going to have all of them uh, in, uh, for the start. And um, what we also have been seeing now is uh, on the collector, we now have uh, immutable list, which is very convenient instead of making a list up later. And as usual, any of the libraries you see, before you put them in production, please test drive if they're actually performant enough. They may look nice, but probably the performance is not so good. So my uh, example for today, at least for the first two libraries, will be a birthday breakfast. So what we do in our company is usually when uh, two, at least two people have a birthday on the same day or close by, then they're going to organize a breakfast uh, for the whole company. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to bring a cake or something. But if there's two people there, they're going to organize a breakfast for us. So it would be actually nice to have an automated system to remind people to organize a breakfast together if they have a birthday on the same day. So what we're going to do is uh, go through the whole list of employees and uh, find out who has a birthday on the same day and then uh, send an email to them to remind them to organize a breakfast for us. So this is what we're going to uh, do now with uh, Java 8 and uh, see how it feels like. So I've already pre prepared a list um, of all the employees in the company here by getting it from the employee register. And I already know what the, what the current month is. And uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, creating a stream over all of the persons. And first of all, filtering all those with uh, have a birthday in the current months. So person get birthday, get months is in the current months. And then we're going to group them. So we have to call collect and then uh, grouping by. And now I don't want to downstream. And we're going to say, OK, uh, let's group them by the months and day, because we don't want to have the year, right? So we have to say uh, person, and then uh, month, day from uh, person, get birthday over here. And then we get back a map. Because collect is the terminal operation, I can't really go on with my stream anymore, right? So I have a final result here, which is a map. 
And all the different steps I have to still apply is like uh, filtering if there is more than one person on the same birthday. I have to start a new stream because this was a terminal operation. Uh, so map.entryset.stream. So we are now operating on map.entry. So we have a key and value. And we're going to filter those uh, by saying entry, entry get get value size is bigger than one. So we need at least two bursts on the same day. And then we're going to sort them just for convenience so it looks nicer. Sort by entry get key, sorting them by the birthday. So we have a consecutive list of birthdays. And then we're going to send out the email. So we have the entry over here and can say send mail with the uh, entry get key, which is a birthday, and entry get value over here. So um, this kind of works. See, I'm always uh, forgetting something, uh, which also tells you that it's probably hard to use the API. I'm always forgetting the comparing here. I can't pass in a function directly to the sorted method. I have to use a comparing over here, right? So I always forget about that. And uh, so um, wh when I actually run us, uh, so this actually works and gives out a list or sending sending out the emails. I just uh, put it to the console for brevity. And But there's a few things over here which I probably don't really like, which is uh, collect grouping by. You always have to, f uh, to remember that you actually have to call collect and then uh, pass in the um, grouping by and for sorted you have to use it with comparing. And I also have to start a new stream in between because it's a final uh, a terminal operation and then I have to start with a new stream. I can also actually omit that one over here and just um, call entry set on it directly and make it look like more neat without uh, having the, the intermediate parameter here over here, but it's still that makes it less obvious that it's actually a terminal operation, so I probably wouldn't do it in code. All right. So um, that's the right one. So this kind of feels like, right, uh, it's lambda, right? It's not lambda, so we don't want to go underneath the, the uh, fire bar over there, right? So it's okay, but we probably can do better. So let's uh, have a look at uh, some other library, which is called uh, Joule. You might actually know Juke. Juke is uh, the library for uh, having SQL queries, which are type safe. And uh, Joule is a sibling of them. And it's actually not the, not the logo over here. It's just uh, for pronunciation reasons, because otherwise you don't know how to pronounce it. And uh, Joule has some, uh, they, they call themselves like useful exten extensions to Java 8 lambdas. <coughs> and what they do is they have uh, uh, extended the stream with a class called seek sequence. And it also implements iterable, which a stream doesn't do. So you can iterate over sequences. And they are always sequential in order. So uh, calling parallel on them, it's implemented because it's uh, extending stream, but it doesn't have any effect. And it has SQL-like collectors, which we're going to see an example in a minute, which are very convenient, actually. And in Java, we only have a function uh, with one parameter and a function with uh, two parameters. So we have function and B function. Uh, over here, we uh, can go up to, up to 16 parameters. And we also have uh, tuples for that. So what you can do, actually, is um, having a sequence, uh, creating a tuple with uh, four values over here, one, two, three, four. And um, because uh, it also supports the functions for this uh, kind of style, you can say uh, map to a long. So from the tuple, I take uh, value 1, uh, 2, and 3, and 4, and multiply them, and then have a single result. So you can only do that in Java if you create your own data structures, but here they are provided with the tuple values. So let's um, actually do the previous example with the Joule library and have a look if this is easier to read and understand. So we're going to create a sequence over here of our existing list to convert it to Joule. And what we can do, uh, now do is we don't, so the sequence already implements stream, so we don't have to call stream anymore. Um, we basically, for the beginning, we do the same. Uh, person get birthday get months is in the current months. And then we can call um, grouped directly. So we don't have to go to uh, collect and then grouping by but we can call group directly. I can also directly pass in a function over here, uh, which I can't do because I need the month's day 
from the person birthday. And then I get, uh, sorry, I have to do something else over here, uh, to list. And uh, what I get back then is a tuple two. So I'm getting a list of uh, month day to the actual person or to the list of persons over here, right? So I'm grouping to a, a list of values. This is why I pass into list as well. And then I have a, a tuple from month day and a list of all the employees at the same birthday. So I'm not getting a map entry anymore, but I'm getting a tuple with two values. And then I can directly go on. So grouped is not an um, intermediate operation. It's not a real terminal operation. It's something in between in this uh, sequence library. So you have to be very sure that you actually understand how these libraries works. Because in some cases, it might be a terminal operation because it has to process everything beforehand, and sometimes it's not. Um, so you're going to filter those uh, again with, um, uh, sorry, it's not a person anymore, it's a, a tuple which we have over here. Uh, tuple v2 is uh, going to be our value over here, and with the s s I'm really bad at typing today. With the size bigger of one. Um, we don't have to sort them anymore because they are sorted. And uh, then what we're going to do is uh, for each uh, send out the email by the tuple send mail t v1 t uh, v2. Because the sequence is always ordered, right? It's already ordered for us, so it's going to be fine. We can execute that, and, and it's going to print out the results. So this is kind of more convenient sometimes for actually reading it. It might not be faster or something like that, but uh, working with the tuples is actually very nice. Uh, but you can also write your own if you want. Write your own library with uh, just tuples in there, and then use them. So uh, what's the real nice addition about Joule is, like I said, because it's a sibling of, of Duke, it's having a lot of things which you know from SQL probably. So who has ever worked with window functions in SQL? Just a few people over there. So this is why I explain them to them, because you might also want to use them in SQL, because they're kind of cool. So what do you mostly do in SQL is uh, to get a result you usually group by, and then you get a single result for a group of uh, values. What you can do with window functions is actually reason about a group which is made around a single line and then create a group around that and uh, get still a result for every single line. So this is called a window. So we are now going to see how it works. Uh, my example over here is uh, my bank account from uh, 2016, right? So I started in September with, uh, with a balance of uh, zero. Then I did a uh, withdraw some money, uh, minus 20 euros, and I had the balance of minus 20 euros. That's very easy to calculate, but for the rest of the, for the, rest of the days, I was uh, too lazy to cal calculate it, so we want to fill all the question marks over there, right? And we're going to do that with the window function. So what we're going to do is uh, we set up two pulls and uh, pass them into a dual sequence over there. So I have uh, all the dates over here. So we're we are starting at zero, so we omit that one. Uh, then we have all the um, bank transactions over here, minus 20, plus 100, and minus 5. And for each of the dates, uh, we want to calculate an additional value, which should go over here, or here to the question marks and the table. And we want to see what the current balance is after the transaction. And um, on the sequence, we can then call window to actually create a window. So what does it do? It uh, sorts our value one, which is by the date. So we sort by date. And then we uh, get um, y uh, take into account all the values previous to that date, so with long min value, up to the current date, which is meaning zero. So it's kind of index-based, right? So you go back to into the, to the past as long as you can and go back to the current uh, date. Um, so what we have uh, here then is, if we look closely, those are our dates. So the window for our first date is just the date itself because we don't have any previous dates. The window for our next date is the 20s and the previous one, which is the 11s. And for the last date, we have all the previous dates over in here. So those are called the windows according to our values. And uh, we can then say, okay, um, map this 
to a new value and get the value from the window, which is still a tuple 2, because here we passed in the tuple 2. The window value is a tuple 2. And uh, concatenate that, so we're going from tuple 2 to tuple 3, with, uh, by creating the, uh, the sum over all the values which we have in our tuple. Uh, or else, if there's nothing in there, we just uh, return 0. So to uh, get this working slowly, what, what we're going to do here is uh, for the first date, um, we only have the minus 20 in here. And for the second date, we have the minus 20 and um, the previous, uh, sorry, we have the current date, which is 100, and the previous one, which uh, is the minus 20, and the result is uh, 80. And then we have minus 20 plus 100 and minus 5, which is 75. And then we just say print out, and it automatically fills in our table. So this is one of the additions which are very nice in the Jew library. So let's go to uh, a language which uh, calls itself actually a functional programming library for uh, Java because it gives you all the immutable and persistent collections. So you have the same names over there, you just have to change your imports. So you still have a list and map and all of the variations over there, but uh, they're in a different package. So you have to organize your imports and uh, you probably don't have to change any code. And then you are just uh, using Waver over there. So if you flip it upside down, then it says uh, Java. And this was previ previously known as uh, Java slang, right? So, but, but they couldn't use the name anymore for legal reasons, so they did a nice trick over there. Um, what we have in there is only pure functions. And we have uh, some tuples predefined as well. And Waver enforces using the Waver data structures, so you don't implement um, a stream, but you have to convert to a stream. And if you want to go back uh, from the Waver data structure, then you have a um, to Java stream method as well. And they have stream-like methods on all of the collections directly, so you don't create a stream from them. You have the methods directly on them. So it's kind of looks similar, but it's a very different concept because you're working with immutable data structures here. So after every operation, if you do an operation on a list, for example, you get, a back, get back a new list, right? Because the original list is, was uh, immutable and you get back a new list. So this actually might put some, some uh, force on the GC. So you have to actually try out if it's better for you, but it's definitely easier to reason uh, about anything which happens in a library with immutable data structures. So um, this is how uh, currying looks in Waver. It actually has directly a curried method on uh, the function 2. So to get uh, from a function with uh, two input parameters to a function which uh, takes one input parameter. So this is uh, kind of weird to read because they also have the return value encoded over here, right? So you still have uh, three generic param parameters over here, type parameters, and you still have uh, two over here, but this is a function one, so it takes one parameter. And um, so to uh, just uh, fix one of the values to two, the first value, you just uh, say uh, sum curried and apply two. So in this case, it will fix a to the value of two. And when I say apply four, it says uh, two plus uh, four is six. So this is a bit easier. Um, lifting, um, lifting is uh, partial, so it's based on partial functi functions. So partial function says that it's only defined on some input values, right? So if you divide by zero, it's not defined. You will get uh, back an exception. And um, if you are lifting that function, then you say, I will always get back a result. But because there's no result by divi di dividing through zero, you get uh, back an uh, option, which is a waiver structure like optional, right? So you uh, get back, in this case, five divided by zero, you get back none. But uh, by lifting, you make a partial function, a total function, which is defined for all input values, not only some input values. They also have a memorization in there, which um, is uh, useful for, yeah, it's not only useful for caching, but make sure that even if you're uh, working with randomized values, that you always get uh, the same value back, uh, like in this case. So to show you some things in Waver, we're not going to do the same example again, but we're going to do something different, which uh, might be coming in a future Java release as well, which is called uh, pattern matching. 
And uh, so this is uh, something which you can do in uh, Java nowadays. Uh, you can do uh, a switch over a number over here, and if I pass in two, then it will just uh, print out the spoken word, which is two over here, right? So it's very simple, but you know you have all the breaks in there, but because we have fall through, and uh, it doesn't doesn't really look that concise as it could be. So um, what we can do with uh, waiver is actually saying um, how's it called? Uh, uh, it's not a match. It's yeah, it's probably match. No, it's not match. So I actually forgot. This is the first time this is happening. Yay! Something new every time. So I quickly have to have to look up uh, how actually the matching method is called. Let's uh, have a peek in my slides. Mm. Over here. So um, what you? Uh, yeah, it's actually match. Um, what, what you have here is, um, so I, I put in all the programming examples I also have on the slides. There's also more content on the slides, so you might want to download the slides later, because uh, when I do live coding, I can't present everything which I have on the slides. So match is actually a method which I uh, have to import, which uh, currently uh, my IDE doesn't like to do, because I don't know what class matches in. So let's see, uh, compare with uh, local history. Let's see what I did this morning and what I did forget since this morning. So the match method is a static import. We're going to, gonna just copy them over and quickly get it done because I really want to show you how it looks because it kind of looks nice. And uh, then we have match. We say uh, match the number we just had and off, and then we can uh, build up uh, different cases for matching. So we can say uh, in the case that we have a one as a value, uh, we want to give back one. And in the case that we have a two as a value, we want to give back two. So this is all we need, and then we have the result over here, or we have a method called result. Uh, this is out result, so it's going to do the same like the previous one, but it looks more concise uh, than the example I actually had on top over here, right? And another nice thing what we can do is actually pattern matching with uh, classes. So if I have an object. Uh, which is the same number over here. And I want to do a match of the object and create some cases based on the type of the object. And what I can do is say a case uh, instance of and say if it's an integer, we actually want to calculate the next value over here. So we say um, i plus 1. And in case uh, that's a date over here, so we say a local date class, and then we have the date, oops, uh, date plus days one, uh, fixed imports. See, I mistype instance of. I always do it with a lowercase o. It has to be an uppercase o to actually be a, a static import. And uh, what we'll then do is uh, actually do a plus one on either the integer or on the local date over here. So you can have a generic plus one method, whatever you pass, and it will always do plus one. So this is also nice, and we might actually see that in uh, some of the future uh, Java releases. Uh, JUnit 5, very briefly, uh, you may have already worked with JUnit 5 because uh, they added some uh, uh, Lambda-style uh, test methods to it. 
uh, it's now much easier because previously you always had to annotate a method which can throw an exception or you manually had to put in a, a try catch over there. Uh, we now have um, an assertion which is called expect throws. Then you uh, just say what kind of exception you're expecting and then you pass in the body which you're trying to call as uh, a lambda with the body over there. And you get back the exception, so you can also test for the exact message of the exception, which is nice, which you pr could previously only do, like with the annotation, you could test that the ex exception is thrown, but if you wanted to check for the message, then you still had to do a manual try catch over there. So another example is um, if we want to test, uh, so somebody told me that all Fibonacci's number over two are odd. If we actually want to test that in a unit test, you're going to do something like that. Uh, write a first, uh, a first test for the first number, um, which might be m one, just uh, checking it for, for making sure that it m may or already be one, which is uh, odd. So test Fibonacci one, uh, test is odd, Fibonacci of one, right? So for the second one, you say test is odd, Fibonacci of two. And then you're going to go on and on and on. So it's not really nice to write those tests, right? So there got to be a better method, and there actually is in um, in JUnit 5, because so I, I have the first uh, two methods over here. So if we uh, run them, we can see the test results over here. So for Fibonacci one and two, they are actually odd, so that's good. And then we say, okay, we want to test all of the other um, Fibonacci numbers if they are actually odd. We create an in-stream um, of a range. We go up to 30 in that case, right? But you can easily change it later. We say map to object. And from the number, we want to create a dynamic test case. We can uh, give this test case a number, so we call it Fibonacci of uh, the number which we have over here. I can also make it more fancy. And then we pass in a lambda with a body over here in which we are actually going to execute the test method we uh, are wanting to do. So we just call test is odd uh, Fibonacci of n. And then we're going to close it and then we're going to return it from this method. And we do an annotation over here, which is called test factory. And then we can run it. And then it will nicely show us all of the test results for all the Fibonacci uh, numbers here. So this is really nice that you can actually code tests in uh, Lambda star. Mm, and... Um, so, reactive. There's a lot of things in the news about uh, reactive programming, which um, is mostly nice for handling uh, asynchronous operations. So you're going to uh, throw something to a library and say, OK, uh, just execute it somewhere, at some place, at some time. I don't really care. But when the result is there, or when you didn't finish after some time, uh, I give you an action which you should ex execute, right? So this is reactive programming. So um, we also have it in, in Java since uh, Java 8 with a, a completable future. This is what you can do with a completable, completable future. So in uh, this case, I'm reading in a file, which is uh, done in the read list method, and I'm getting back a completable future. So I, I'm actually doing it asynchronously. I'm just telling it, OK, read the file in. And uh, then if, you, if you're done, I will actually print out the result. So I set it up by saying, uh, then apply, then apply uh, says, OK, when you're actually finished and um, executed the feature without any problem, then I print out, so the list has been read in, this, these are the values. If you have an exception, I say, OK, it failed reading in it, and uh, print out the exception method. And uh, in the final case, I say, OK, uh, system out print line, print all the values. This is, I mean, it works, but for me, it's always hard to remember, actually, how completable future really works, because somehow the method names are really confusing for me. I don't know, may maybe for somebody else it's uh, different, but for me it's really hard to keep them in my mind.
There's a, another library which uh, was already there before Java 8, which is called uh, JDeferred. Um, this uh, works with uh, deferred execution, which you may know from, uh, from uh, JavaScript libraries, which give you back a promise, and then you can reason about the promise. So uh, with uh, JDeferred, um, basically the, the same example, um, I create a deferred object somewhere, which uh, will be executed somewhere, and then I say, okay, um, I get a promise from there, and when it's done, I want to print the result. When it fails, I, I print rejected, and I can also um, print out progress. So if I'm reading in a file and I want to print out progress, how, how long it actually takes to read in the file, and uh, this is uh, the method how to do it. And in the end, I always print out, like in this example, dot because it couldn't fit on the slides, right? <laughs> so uh, I, uh, normally it should be something more meaningful and you actually get back the results so you can print out the result. So for me, those uh, methods are far easier to understand than the methods I have on the completable future. Then we have uh, also in the same space, uh, reactive programming, we have uh, Rx Java. Uh, Rx Java is mostly well known for its nice marble diagrams, actually ma making it easier to understand how certain stream methods work because they have the same methods over there, filter map reduce. So for example, this is an explanation about uh, how flat map works. So if you're using a flat map and you have an input value, which is uh, a circle over here, and you're calling flat map, and what uh, the flat map does is from the circle, it gets to uh, two or more results, which are, how are they called, uh, diamonds in English? Yeah, which are called, uh, which are then diamonds, and then flat map flat flattens them into a single stream again. So you don't have a list of those diamonds, but you have uh, instead a list of all the diamonds uh, next to each other in the stream. So those are the ma di marble diagrams which help you understand actually how some of the methods work. But this is not the thing we're going to do today. Um, Rx Java has uh, some other nice features. Um, if you want to work, uh, sometimes you have to test if, if timings to work, and it's really hard to actually program it. So this is one of the features I want to show you. So an observable is kind of, it has stream-like methods as well, but it's also like, like a promise, so you can observe what is happening in a stream. It also works if you connect to remote streams and so on. So it's kind of really nice, and just for, for uh, the time we have, I'm going to show you a very nice, uh, simple example. So for now, I'm uh, just creating a list of three different values, and I'm going to repeat them uh, 20 times over here. So uh, this is the list we get out, right? So it's 20 times repeated all the same values. Very, very simple. But what I can also do is um, create an observable um, of time. So I'm going to say a timer. And I'm going to create a timer which uh, will emit something every second. This is called the time emitter over here. I'm going to comment in that code to actually make it do something. And for the time emitter, I'm going to call a subscribe. So with the subscribe, um, I can actually print out all the values. And observables only do something if somebody is subscribed to them. So um, once a second, we should actually uh, get a value out of those. And um, you see how it works uh, in just a minute. If I combine those, uh, time emitter and zip with is also a nice method, which is usually present. It's not present on streams, but it's uh, present on uh, a lot of other of those libraries I've shown you today. So with zip with, you can combine um, combine two strings actually. And for now, we omit the time value over here, so we don't want to print the number, but we only want to print um, one of the items, so I just uh, return um, the y over here. And then as I uh, zip with subscribe, and let's see what it does. So it will now print out one value uh, every second, which doesn't really work. I don't know why. Some uh, it stops too early. It should only stop after after 90 seconds, which it doesn't do. So actually, you should see uh, 
what can I do about it? What can I do about it? Just uh, mm, if I wait, I'm gonna block the thread it's running in. I don't know. I'm gonna figure that out later. So um, something else I can do is uh, actually doing groups over the values. So um, with my existing zip width, I can say that I want a window, and this time uh, it's a time window, so I can group values of 10 seconds. Time unit seconds. So I have a 10 second window over here. I call uh, subscribe, and with this group of values I now get out, so they are grouped, so it's collecting values for 10 seconds. And I just say group uh, start with to convert it. Uh, 10 seconds. So this is a group. And I'm going to sub subscribe to that one. And then see if that works. I think it does. Yeah. So this is uh, what you can get. <coughs> what you can get out there, actually. Yeah. So this is uh, nice for, for acting with values which are yeah like timing-based, and you can do all kinds of different stuff, like time out after, after a certain amount of time, and you can also you reuse the observables, so they are not like finished like streams, you can build them up and actually connect them to different kinds of stuff. So if you want to see a working example, I kind of screwed up with that one. <laughs> There's a working example in my GitHub account. Um, so, I have like three minutes left. Okay, that's enough. Uh, pattern matching, like uh, I said before, it's probably will be added to Java in one of the future releases. They are still arguing about the about the uh, syntax they are actually going to use. So this is uh, one of the examples which are connected to the JEP. I still think they they now arrived at some kind of error syntax or something like that. So this is what you might have in the future um, that you like the previous example I had with uh, integer and local date. So you can uh, now match over classes over here, um, and you also have an extractor over here. So you say in the int node I probably have an int field in there, and with the int field I want to do something, right? So in the uh, neck node or egg uh, at node, I have, uh, for example, two fields in there, which is left and right, and I want to do something with left and right, so I can extract the values out of the uh, object I'm given here and actually do something with it, which uh, might be use cases for it. Um, you may have something in mind for that. So, as a summary, uh, those are all the uh, libraries which are actually in the slides, so it's a bit more libraries than I can actually show you today. So uh, you should download the slides, and there's a lot of examples over there. There's also a um, summary over there which uh, of the methods they are providing. And um, if you actually want to see the video, which I did only with slides, there's uh, some up on YouTube. And uh, for uh, the slides and code in general, you can just uh, go to my website, or you can find me on Twitter. I will also post the slides over there, so you can easily find them. And we still have like two minutes left, so are there any questions? Maurice. So what, of all those um, functional libraries that you've surveyed, which one, which features would you like to have seen? You obviously couldn't put all of those into the standard Java library. What do you think they should have had in the platform? So Maurice's question was, um, what are the features I would have liked to see in the standard Java library of the libraries we have uh, just seen? I think that's not really easy to answer. Um, I think some of the features are could be really easy to do, like for example the sorted method could directly actually uh, take an... Um, uh, how's it called? A function? So we don't have to pass on the, the comparing anymore. That would be actually a neat addition. And uh, then collect and grouping. You know, I, you know it collect is more general, but it's still hard to understand, I think, for, for a lot of people that they have to use uh, collect and grouping. I mean, you did an entire talk on explaining how downstreams work. I still don't get it how they work. 
<laughs> so I think that c there should be some improvements over there with streams because I think mo mostly people are working with streams. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the rest of the things you can just uh, drag in as, as libraries and use um, as additions when you want to use them. All right, any other question? You can also come to me later and uh, talk to me or uh, find me on Twitter. DMs are also open if you wanna don't want to ask in public. And uh, yes, feedback is always welcome, so please go to the app and vote. It's always very valuable to actually get feedback for the speakers. Thank you.